shining light that can illuminate the dark corners of reality that we've not been able to access directly, right? We can't literally see the beginning, but we can use the math to peer back using the equations to get some understanding of what happened at the beginning. But don't we need to at some point have some evidence from physical reality? No. But what about the cosmic... <laughs> no, we do. No, no, it's, it's absolutely crucial. And, and, <laughs> and, and without that, we're, we're, we're just sort of you know, speculating. And the evidence comes from so many places. So first, Einstein's mathematics makes predictions about things that we can directly access, like the bending of starlight by the sun, which was tested in 1919 during a solar eclipse. And just as Einstein predicted, the stars were slightly shifted in the sky because of the sun's presence. And you know, you know the story well, but perhaps not everybody does. Einstein then gets a telegram alerting him that his ideas had been confirmed through the observation. And somebody asked him, Professor Einstein, what would you have said if the data showed that the theory was not confirmed? And he said, I'd be sorry for the dear Lord because the theory is correct. Yeah. You know, so, so this is how certain you know, he was of these ideas. But that's just one example. When it comes to cosmology and the Big Bang, we can use the equations to make predictions for how much residual heat should be left over from the Big Bang today, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation. And we can make predictions on how the temperature of that heat should vary from one location in space to another. And then we can do measurements, and the measurements agree with the theoretical predictions to fantastic accuracy. And that is a breathtaking confirmation that this mathematics is not just speculation, that the math is actually aligning with how the world works. Give me an example of that measurement of the cosmic background radiation. I mean, what, they go to the North Pole or South Pole? So there, there are many ways to access it. You can access it through satellite-borne telescopes, such as the WMAP experiment, the Wilkinson Micros um, uh, Background Radiation Probe, which has done a fantastic job at measuring the microwave background radiation, the microwave anisotropy probe. But the more recent one, I think, is the one you're referring to, is the so-called BICEP-2 experiment down at the South Pole, where for three years, a team of astronomers pointed this telescope at a patch of the southern polar sky and extracted information about the microwave background radiation that, again, bears out a yet more subtle prediction of and the theory. And this is radiation that actually emanated from the bang. Yes. So in the beginning, it was hot, right? Really hot. And as the universe expanded, the heat was spread out. It diluted and it cooled down. And you can calculate how cold it should be today, and it's about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So that's the temperature of deep space, not when there's sources like stars nearby, but if you're in deep, empty space, that's the temperature. But you can go one step further and not just calculate the average temperature, you can calculate how the temperature should vary from place to place, and the math shows that it should vary by on the order of one one hundred thousandth of a degree tiny variation and you can do these very precise measurements and indeed see the temperature variation in just the pattern that the mathematics predicts. What do you mean when you call something the fabric of the cosmos? It's a hard question. Is space really a thing or is it just a useful concept in order to organize our perceptions of reality. You're over there. You're further away in space. The table is yet further. Is space merely the vocabulary that allows me to articulate locations, or is space really a thing? And nobody fully knows the answer to that, but in Einstein's general relativity, and deep, different people interpret it differently, I see space as a thing in Einstein's theory. Space meaning the fabric of space and time together. That's right. Space and time are stitched together and in Einstein's special And would they would exist even if nothing else existed? That's right. That's right. And there's been a lot of debate about this. You know, if you were to remove everything from space, the moon, the sun, earth, everything, what would be left? Would you have an empty universe that still has space and time, or would you have nothing? I mean, a good analogy is if you take an alphabet, right, and you start to remove the letters, Z and X and A and B, when you remove that last letter, what's left? Is it like an empty alphabet? Not really. It's like nothing, because the alphabet comes into existence with the letters that make it up. 
is that true of the universe? Does it come into existence only when there's stuff populating it? Or can there be an empty stage called space-time that would exist even in the absence of matter? I think it's the latter. There's a wonderful thought experiment which you deal with in, I think, your first book, Newton's Bucket. Yes. Explain how that helps you think that there is a fabric of space. And yeah, time. so this is a, a thought experiment that Isaac Newton came up with when he was trying to understand, basically, if space was a thing. And he imagined taking a bucket and filling it with water. And he noted that as you spin the bucket, the water climbs up the sides of the bucket. So I think, you know, even kids do this at the beach, right? You spin it around and yeah. it climbs up the what sides. What we would call inertia. That's right. So, so the, the water has some intrinsic quality called inertia that causes it to resist that motion. And when it resists, it kind of gets pushed out. It goes up the sides. So he imagined doing that in a completely empty universe. Now, there's some issues about that because gravity is part of what makes the shape. So we actually imagine now taking two stones, same idea, connecting them by a rope and spinning them around. Yeah. Would the rope pull taut? And to Newton, it was obvious that the rope would pull taut, even in empty space. And therefore, he said, what is the rope and rock spinning with respect to? There's nothing there. There's no earth, no sun, no anything. Therefore, the rope and the rocks must be spinning with respect to a something called space. Space itself must be setting the benchmark, the reference, with respect to which that motion is happening. Others then came along and said, no, we disagree. You remove everything from the universe and you take your little spinny rock and you know, ropey thing and it's not going to pull taut. It'll just kind of stay completely limp. And it's still an issue that people debate. Is there any evidence we could find one way or the other? It's very hard to remove everything from the universe, right? I mean, that's, a, that's kind of what you'd like to do. So what you do is you try to find alternate implications of one perspective or another. And I would say as today, most people, I haven't done a survey, but I suspect that most people would say it would pull taut that space does, space time does set the reference frame for a certain kind of motion, accelerated motion, but there are others who are holdouts and disagree with that. What did we learn from the Large Hadron Supercollider? Uh, we learned a lot. We learned how to build the biggest experiment that our species has ever embarked upon. These are really, you know, the, the fantastic temples of the 20th, 21st century. They are our pyramids in a sense, but in terms of the science that we have extracted, the most important thing is the discovery of the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle. I think most people have, have probably heard something. I mean, people know about this Higgs, Higgs idea, right? So there was this particle that was predicted mathematically in 1964 by Peter Higgs and many others who really deserve equal credit for it. But it was just a mathematical idea that was a solution to a puzzle. How do particles get mass? How do they resist being pushed when you want to speed them up or slow them down? And the idea was space is filled with a kind of molasses-like substance called now the Higgs field, like a steam bath that we don't see that's all around us. And that gives mass to particles. That's right. As particles try to move through the steam bath, this cosmic molasses, they experience, roughly speaking, a kind of resistance-like drag force. And that what is, is the head. relationship of the Higgs field to the fabric of space-time? Well, if the Higgs idea is correct, there'd be virtually no distinction between them. This substance would fill every nook and cranny of space, and in a sense it would be unremovable unless somehow you could recreate maybe the temperatures of the very early universe. So the analogy that I think sort of captures that idea is, you know, if, if I don't know, if, do you have any tattoos? Okay, well, good. Uh, I don't know where you were looking and I am not going to ask. Um, but imagine that you start to have more and more tattoos. And ultimately, if you cover your entire body, then the distinction between your skin and the tattoo becomes kind of meaningless. You are the illustrated man at that point. You're completely covered with tattoos. Similarly, space is completely filled with this Higgs stuff. And if you can't remove it, there's almost no distinction between space and the stuff that fills what it. What if they hadn't found it and they had found that there is no Higgs field? Does the entire standard model of quantum theory go out the window? Well, that would have been far more exciting yeah. for, for a theorist, less exciting, you know, for 
Peter Higgs well, would, would, and, and we, others. Would, would we have lost mass and lost weight? Uh, well, I don't think the universe cares much about our understanding of the okay. universe, so okay. it would have shrugged it off and said, silly little humans. But the, the, a wonderful thing as a theorist, we would have been sent back to the blackboard to answer these deep puzzles. Where does the heft of the fundamental constituents come from? That would have been enormously exciting for an idea that we thought was the answer to be proved wrong. We are not, there sometimes is a misperception that physicists or scientists more generally get stuck on an idea and they become so wedded to it that they'll hold on to it even in the face of evidence that suggests the contrary. No, it's completely the opposite. We love it when ideas that we cherish are proved wrong because that's the biggest opportunity of a lifetime to try to come up with the next new idea that will take its place. Now in this example, it was a wonderful triumph of mathematics and experiment where the idea was confirmed. Now mathematics has led you to superstring theory of which you're uh, very associated. Explain why the math led you there. Well, since the 1960s and 70s, people have tried to put together Einstein's ideas of gravity, the general theory of relativity that we've been talking about, together with another theory, the theory of the small ingredients, quantum well, mechanics. And by it the turns way, out, yeah. Einstein, try, I mean, on his deathbed, he was doing that. Well, sort of. Einstein was trying to put gravity together with electromagnetic theory right. to build a unified theory, thinking that he could do an end run around the uncomfortable features of quantum mechanics he didn't like so much. So he was hoping in some sense to like go this way and then like do yeah. that to quantum mechanics. But that seemed not to really work out. So we are trying the more straightforward approach of putting gravity and quantum theory together. And the standard model of particle physics, which predicted the Higgs particle, hugely successful, is unable to put gravity and quantum mechanics together. That leads us to this new approach, which at least on paper, superstring theory does put gravity and quantum mechanics together. Uh, is there anything coming up in the next five or ten years that you would say would help give you a physical test of what you're doing there? I, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, you know, I wish the answer, you, you know, I can, I can go speculative here, uh, you know, which may be speculation on speculation, which is always an uncomfortable place to be. But just to say, we don't believe any of these ideas until they make predictions that we can test. So let's be real clear here. If you ask me, do I believe in string theory? The answer is absolutely no. I never have and I never will until there is experimental data that supports it. Having said that, it is the most promising and, I have to tell you, mathematically compelling approach to putting gravity and quantum mechanics together, and that's an important puzzle to solve. That drives us to continue working on it. In the best of all worlds, when they turn the Large Hadron Collider back on in 2015, is it possible that some of these ideas will make contact with observation? Yeah, it's possible. We could see evidence of extra dimensions. That's one of the other features of the theory. Particles slam together, some of the debris can get knocked out of our dimensions according to the math. We would recognize that by a loss of energy. People are looking for this. We can see a whole class of particles called supersymmetric particles, which the theory predicts that we haven't yet seen. We could see microscopic black holes that would decay into a spray of other particles. So all of these things are possible, but I don't like to place hope on them in that I consider them long shots. Mm -hmm. So when they don't come through, I don't want it to be, hey, you guys predicted that that was going to happen, and then it didn't. No. It's possible, but unlikely. Is it inevitable in superstring or string theory that there are other universes? It's not inevitable. It is one of the very controversial developments over the last but 10 years. But you believe it's true? Again, believe is a funny, funny word. So do I believe in other universes? Absolutely not. Do I find it a compelling possibility, and can I see how the math naturally suggests it, and does that compel me to work on it? It does. But until there's observation or experimental support, I don't believe anything. Uh, and I guess Einstein once said that one of the grand questions was, did the good Lord have a choice yeah. in the way he invented the universe? Explain that and answer it for us, or for Einstein. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Einstein asked a, a very important question, which is, could the universe have been otherwise? Could the mass of the particles be different? Could gravity have behaved differently? Did God, did the Lord have a choice or is somehow that dictated by logic and mathematics alone? 
And we don't know the answer, but if these ideas of other universes are correct, then it's completely opposite. It may be that every possibility is played out on the grand landscape of reality. So rather than having one unique universe, it might be all possible universes. The truth is probably somewhere in between. We've run out of time, but let me hit you with a couple of quick things. Sure. One of which is, why does this all matter? Well, if you ask my mom, it doesn't, right? You know. She wanted you to be a doctor. Yeah, not exactly, a PhD, right? So yeah. it, it gives her a headache and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but I think it helps many people get a sense of how we fit into the larger picture, how we're part of this spectacular cosmos. And I don't consider it making us somehow small and insignificant, although we are, but take into account these little tiny creatures walking around on the surface of the earth can figure out what happened a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the beginning and what things will be like a hundred billion years into the future. That to me is this <laughs> amazing story. So that is the most exciting drama of discovery we've ever been engaged with. That's why it matters. And for people who want to hear more, there's a World Science Festival that you yes. and Tracy Day, your wife, is doing, and World Science University. Uh, give it a quick pitch. Yes, yeah, so World Science U is a new online platform that we at the World Science Festival have developed to try to get these ideas out to the general public, but not just the level we're talking about here, which is interesting and exciting, but the real math behind it in a highly produced, highly visual way. So if you like relativity or this kind of stuff, check it out. It's a fun just, way to learn. Just Google World Science University World Science Brian, yeah. and Brian Green. Yep. And the festival is when? May 28th to June 1st. We have and you can buy events. tickets? You can buy tickets. They just went on sale, although a few things are already sold out. But uh, 50 events around the city that will allow you to immerse yourselves in science. Brian, thank you. Thank you.